uh, to do with this program is to really just bring folks together who are in the game of trying to land a uh, postgraduate public defender or prosecution position um, um, to be able to talk about lessons learned in terms of things that have gone well, things that have been challenging, um, things that if they had had the hindsight at the time they would have done differently both while they were in school and moving forward. Um, and then we also have Professor Neitz here and myself to talk about ways in which you can think of using the resources here at the school to maximize your potential moving forward into a post-bar position. Um, and I'm hoping this will be sort of a fishbowl discussion, like a conversation. I have some themes. Um, and I do want to encourage folks who are here to just ask questions too. We're recording this, which is why we're using microphones. It's a little formal for such a small group of people. <laughs> but just know that it's so that this can be preserved so folks during the year can watch it too. Um, if you have questions, just put your hand up and we'll include you in the conversation. Um, and I have a few themes, and if I don't cover something that you're interested in, just or want to talk about. Um, first, actually, can we go around and folks introduce themselves and say where you've worked and are working? Do you start? Sure. Hello. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm Angelica Leonardo. I interned and I postbarred at the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. And currently, I'm a volunteer attorney at Bay Area Legal Aid and part time here, um, graduate fellow at admissions. My name is Brittany Sharp. I also. Um, interned and did my post-bar fellowship at the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. I'm currently looking for a job uh, at a public defender's office and I work part-time at a restaurant. I'm Professor Neitz. I am the externship director here at GGU and so my job in addition to teaching classes is to connect you with employers out in the world for externships which you can get credit for. Um, so I'm here to answer some of the logistical questions people might have about how to get credit for an externship, um, how to secure an externship, that sort of thing. Uh, I also, in law school, had a number of internships, including the San Francisco Public Defender's Office um, and the Justice Department and that sort of thing. And I was able to parlay those experiences through clever things I wrote in statements attached to cover letters um, into uh, employment after law school. So I'm happy to talk about that nature of this as well. <laughs> My name is Eric Calgary. Um, I did a uh, long criminal internship with the Solano County District Attorney's Office, and then that led into the post bar position there and uh, a two month contract position that just ended. So I'm currently looking for work. And we have one more person joining our fishbowl. I'm so sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Just say your name and uh, where you post-bar position. Uh, I'm Evan Guse. I'm Evan Guse. I did a post-bar at Santa Clara District Attorney's Office. So um, the first thing I, I thought I would just have folks comment on a bit is really what is a post-bar position? I mean, it's it seems like it's become an industry industry standard now in the criminal litigation world that folks do these post bar positions, many of which are volunteer, um, very few of which are paid, and then that leads into hopefully a longer term um, a longer term chance of employment. But sometimes it leads to contract work before it leads to more long term employment. So I thought maybe folks could talk about what the counties do at places where you've worked to give a feel for what. His bar positions even look like in the field right now. <laughs> All right, I'll go first. <laughs> um, so I had interned at the uh, Solano Attorney's Office. Like the internship actually through some friends in school who were interning there. And uh, before that, I had, uh, worked as an intern law clerk for a juvenile dependency judge in Alameda County. And she was a former prosecutor. Suggested that you get too frazzled sitting here working behind the bench. You need to get out there and argue. You should try prosecution. So I went and uh, I contacted some friends who were interested, and they sort of led me to Solano. Um, and it wasn't hard. I just told them, "Look, I'd like to intern here." And at the time, they were just accepting people who walked up and said they wanted to go. Um, clear background check. They will do a background check. Um, and then I interned there for almost a year. Well, yeah, a year. My last year of law school. Uh, and then. Uh, at the end of that, I just said, I, I want to be a post here. And they said, okay, yeah, you've done great work. 
Um, and the, the, the type of work I did as an intern was very similar to the work I did as a post bar. Uh, I was certified, because I'd gone through the HLP program, got certified at the end of that first 1L summer. Uh, I was able to not only just do the research and writing assignments, which you do a lot of those in criminal law, in, in, in a post bar, and in internship, uh, but I was able to appear in court on hearings, promotions, and things like that, as long as I had a supervisor. And one of the nice things about Solano at the time was that at, toward the end, they gave us a supervisor to do a jury trial. So I was able to do one jury trial as at the end of my internship, and then during my post bar, I was able to do other jury and court trials. Um, so the, the the work I did ranged, and it a lot of it was based on how hard you work and how hard you try, how how you can impress your employers. And, and I wasn't paid for any of it, so they're not really employers, but. I'm sure you understand. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so I volunteered, or I interned at the public defender's office in San Francisco throughout law school, and then um, I, that's the only place I interned. I recommend interning at as many places as you possibly can just to see what it's about. Um, but I didn't. I was just at the San Francisco one the whole time, so um, when it came time to post bar, I knew I wanted to stay there, and I knew a lot of the attorneys there, so I found, I talked to the woman in charge, Kathy Asada. She found me another supervising attorney, and um, post bar, I, it was a lot of the same work, but actually less of the tedious stuff, um, more of the actual motion writing and helping with prelims and second chairing um, numerous trials. So I really enjoyed doing it there. I, I recommend it as well. Um, and just make sure my advice is to keep track of everything you do at your externship, everything, because you'll need it later and you'll really regret it if you don't. Well, I just want to add for the San Francisco Public Defender's Office, so there are two different um, ways that you can volunteer after you graduate. So you can post bar, which is similar to an internship position, but after you've actually passed the bar, then you can apply to be a volunteer attorney and when you're a volunteer attorney, then you actually get to have your own cases and you get to do your own trials. So there's a big difference between the two. And so look closely at the um, application process and the deadlines because they might not align to when you receive your, um, your bar score or your bar results. So I think um, I, my experience was probably noticeably noticeably different uh, in the district attorney's office in Santa Clara than would be normally the case for other interns because I was in their white collar unit. Uh, and I think that's the case because in having worked now for two different district attorneys, those units are segregated. Uh, but I think the, the advice that I can give that is probably the most analogous to working in any other DA's office is that you need to look not only at the um, substantive materials, as Brittany mentioned, Eric mentioned, that you have uh, collected and worked on while you're there, but also the intangibles, the networking, the connections with attorneys that you make while you're there, even informal connections with office staff, things like that. Uh, in my personal case, I had worked for the San Francisco District Attorney's Office in their white collar unit after HLP as well, uh, and they weren't hiring post bars for that unit. The post bars worked in the main um, hall of justice. But I wanted to post bar there, and my supervisor in that sorry in that field, and my supervisor knew that, so he, through that connection uh, that he and I had made, was able to go and find a similar placement for me in Santa Clara. Uh, so again, the skills are not just you know what you produce, but who you know and what you make of it. So we have already had a number of themes I want us to touch on around networking, um, how you transition from you know, being an intern into a post bar, things like that. Um, one of the things I want to just highlight is that really that's come up is that it has become an industry standard to demand a high level of volunteerism from folks um, who are graduating from law school going into criminal litigation. And I think that's something that there needs to be a level of transparency about and also a discussion about how folks are navigating that. So there are a small number of either, so the typical trajectory now, industry-wide, is that folks do um, a post-bar position while they're awaiting their bar results. Um, and rarely, those are paid positions. 
increasingly, some, um, some offices are priding themselves in not taking volunteers, but that usually means you have to secure your own outside funding. Um, so GGU um, offers a bridge fellowship program to folks who are post-bar, um, which provides a modest stipend to people going forward. So that's one way that people can secure money, and I'm interested in how other folks might have supplemented that. Um, but at any rate, so after this post-bar thing, men folks can go into frequently these volunteer positions. Um, some offices are starting to refuse to have volunteer attorneys, but sometimes that's also because they just don't take new hires on. Um, so I think the more you network, the more you can know what the offices do and the places that you're looking for. Um, but before we sort of get into the nuance of like how you apply, how you get the experience, those things, I wonder if folks could actually talk about struggles around the volunteerism and finding um, support around payment. And we have one more person joining our group. Come in. And so we're just generally talking about questions, and you can jump in when you feel comfortable. Okay. So now you get both sides of Solomon County. Um, <laughs> defender's office. <laughs> sure. I am Ari Bulmash. I'm a rec recent graduate. I graduated in December. Um, I've been in Solano County for about two and a half years at the alternate public defender's office, and um, just passed the bar, so now I'm looking for work. <laughs> So about the volunteerism, um, yeah, I, uh, it's crazy, but this is how you do, right? Even for the externship credits, you're paying someone to work. And for me, I live in the East Bay and traveling back and forth to Solano County, you know, you pay $5 in bridge toll and about $10 in gas costs, about $15 a day to go back and forth to work for free. Um, so I tried to make the most out of it for myself by working as much as possible, and I worked full-time plus. And what you don't realize as an intern in a postbar sometimes is that, you know, a deputy district attorney in the misdemeanor department at a, P, at a DA's office and or a PED's office, you're putting 60 plus hours a week. You're always working. Um, so you need to be prepared for that. Uh, fortunately, I am married to a tenured professor at a university. So I supplemented that way to a certain extent while I was interning and everything else. Um, but then after graduation, you know, I did rely on the the Bridge Fellowship money really supported me to go back and forth. And when that ran out, I had to go to them and say, look, I can't come in and volunteer anymore um, because I don't have, I can't afford to spend $15 a day to drive back and forth. I have children that need lunches for school and everything else, bills to pay. And that's when they offered me the contract position during their hiring process for two months. And so that helped me to last through the two months, but then at the end of that, and so now that's where I am today. Um, but that office that I worked in uh, relied on volunteers. I mean, they're the government, right? Uh, MTV now cannot take interns without paying them because they were exploiting them. The government doesn't hold itself to that same standard. Um, so at one point, uh, almost our entire misdemeanor division were volunteer attorneys and post um, So, and and it gives you this sense of being important. You get a lot of praise, a lot of, hey, you're doing a great job, you're really helping us out. Um, but you have to remember the other thing they'll tell you in other offices, there are no promises. And what they're telling you there is, look, you're an intern, you're a number, you could be turned over tomorrow. I'll find someone else going to volunteer. So you should know that going in, right? So that when you show up at their door, you do, you ingratiate yourself to the boss because you want the connections, you want to do good work. You want to prove that, yes, I can be a successful prosecutor or public defender. But you also have to know for yourself, I need to build up as much experience doing hearings and trials as I can because that's what they're going to ask you. And that's why you need to keep track. Here's how many, here's how many suppression motions I've written. Here's how many oppositions I've written. Here's everything you do you should keep track of. And you should keep copies of it. And if you get up to a certain level where you're writing work for some of the felony attorneys and you're writing out novel issues or coming up with novel arguments, save that for your writing sample. Because it's a public document now. It can look just like it is. Um, and you can use that as a writing sample. It's really important to have. A nice writing sample that addresses some interesting legal issue is your standard motion to dismiss or motion to suppress, that kind of thing. Sorry, I got a little off of the volunteer. <laughs> Let me to jump ahead. Okay. Well, um, I guess having worked in a DA's office, I'd be another good transition. So 
Um, I think the point that I really wanted to touch on is that the volunteerism aspect, in my mind, it serves two purposes. One, they get the free labor, which is nice for them. But the other is that it's really kind of a sorting tool. They're using it to see, do you want to be at a DA's office or I guess a PD's office? Because if you don't, you can probably go find paid work, maybe, or some other avenue. Uh, in, in working for two different DA's offices, I found that everyone that is there wants to be there. And it is no less competitive than any other kind of placement. Uh, the volunteerism is a way for them to say, you know, okay, uh, how, how true are you to, to wanting to be a career DA? Um, that said, I think that the volunteer a bit, um, openings or positions themselves depend on the nature of the district attorney's office. So uh, right now I'm actually speaking with a former supervisor about volunteering at San Francisco, and that seems to be a much more fluid process. But by comparison, Santa Clara is very rigid about it. If you want to volunteer after you've done a post bar there, it's only for the limited duration of any outstanding projects you still have going. Uh, and I've heard that directly firsthand from the hiring coordinator uh, at, their, uh, at their office, Jerice Moore. Um, you can be sworn in as a, a volunteer deputy DA for maybe up to a month, uh, but as soon as those projects end, they, they don't keep you on. And that's because they have a very rigid hiring cycle. Um, it starts in the fall, and I think, I, I don't take my word on any of this, but they don't want people just kind of using that as a liaison or transition into a full-time deputy DA position. So, I'll back up. You wanted volunteering and, I guess, how to support yourself while how you're volunteering. Manage, how do you how manage it? Okay, so I know that they have touched on, I guess, being at the office a lot, and it's true, it is a lot of work, so you do feel like you have to put in a lot of hours to get everything done, but they also understand that you're a volunteer and that you're not getting paid, or at least at the San Francisco Public Defender's Office. And as long as you're clear about, you know, I can come in this many days, and as long as you're great on those days, you can go and get a part-time job. Because they understand that you can't, you know, you can't volunteer forever, and you can't just volunteer and be able to live in San Francisco. So I think as long as you, you make that clear in the beginning and just make yourself stand out, because they do get a lot of volunteers and interns, so it's not just about how many motions you write or how many trials you, you take on, but also being prepared and doing well in those tasks. Um, <clears throat> I'd also say, uh, so I took the bar twice, and the first time um, I took it, I didn't look for a job. I relied solely on the Bridge Fellowship, which is so unbelievably helpful, but it's not we live in San Francisco, rents are high. It's not always enough to cover everything you need. So first time I struggled and I called my mother a lot. Second time it was, I need to find, an, find a, a part-time job. I had to. So like Angelica said, I told the public defender's office, I'll be here Monday, Wednesday, Friday, all day long. Um, if you need me to come in another day, just let me know. And I started working at a restaurant part-time. And actually the way I found that job is through my mentor at the office. She happened to know somebody who knew somebody else. So getting to know those people, and like Angelica said, in the San Francisco office, they understand what you're, what you're going through. They know you don't have money, they know you're volunteering, and they know you need the money. So they're very willing to help you out and give you advice, and um, I really recommend finding, trying to find like a good mentor that you can go to who will really help you out um, and give, give you advice on the future. So uh, volunteering, let's see, what else? I don't know, yeah, I think that's it. <laughs> Do you want to add anything into this? Or? Sure. Um, I, I'll say that uh, adding on to some of that, that when I started in Solano, I mean, I was a night student. I was already working two jobs, and I decided to discuss with them the idea of working part time, which is uh, something you again you should approach from the very beginning, and you should make it clear that you know I have to support myself, and just so they kind of understand what you're getting into. Um, I would try to make it, if you're going to do something like that, try to make yourself flexible around the schedule of the court because there are certain days where you're gonna get better experiences. I've seen quite a few interns come in part-time and they work on two of the worst days that we have. I mean, they never get to do anything in court. They sit, they sit and research all the time. You also may run into supervisors who do not, um, want you doing a lot of work in court if you're not going to be there full-time showing dedication. So you have to show that you can do that as well. You can put in the work and show that you're committed and that you're willing to um, go to school and 
work if you're doing that and do the internship and do good work. And I think it's important to connect with the right people to show that you're going to do that. Um, Solano is also pretty rigid. I think you were mentioning about hiring. They, on the PD side, unlike the DA side, they don't like to hang, hang on to volunteers. They're okay with you doing the Bridge Fellowship and continuing on in that way and getting paid. But after that, they start to get a little antsy. They're worried about their union, even though I think it's the same union. Um, they, so they don't like to do that. So just keep that in mind if you're looking at Solano. I know Golden Gate's been sending a lot of people to Solano County. Um, that's something to keep in mind for the future. And honestly, I don't know that my path is always the best path. It's worth it to get experiences in a lot of different counties. Uh, I don't know if Eric's running into that problem now. But I, I'm lucky enough where, lucky or not, that I've had multiple supervisors who actually have left the county and they've gone to other counties. So I have connections in other places. But it's really good to expose yourself as much as possible. This is an incredibly difficult job market. It doesn't matter that counties are getting more money. Government work, government funding works very slowly. So if the economy is picking up, the counties don't like to throw a lot of money at the at the district attorney and the public defender offices right away. When tax dollars start coming in and they start getting more money, they have to go through tons of budget meetings. These are annual meetings and it takes a long time. So get yourself out there as much as possible. Get yourself exposed to as much as you can if this is the kind of work you want to get into. And when you're done with it and, and you're done with school and you pass the bar and you're ready to go, go everywhere. Be willing to go anywhere in the state or out of state if you have to. I mean, that's just, it's really important to, to be willing to move and not centralize yourself just to San Francisco or even the Bay Area. I mean, this, you know how impacted we are with law schools here. Solano is no different. We get three to 500 applicants every time they run a hiring process. So that's, you know, I, that's kind of advice I'd have there. I was gonna say, with San Francisco, they typically won't take uh, first years. They want you to have a little bit more trial experience. So with what I was told, my goal is to find a, a public defender job in anywhere in California, and then hopefully come back to the Bay Area after a year or two and be able to work in that office. Yeah, uh, well, one more thing on that. I will say uh, Fresno just hired a new public defender. Their public defender there was on the outs. If you're, I don't know if any of you are looking at public defender work, but they were on the outs. They were really not supported by their line deputies. They were frustrated. They weren't getting uh, pay raises. They were, have the highest caseloads in the state. And so they hired a new public defender, and she's gotten a lot of funding for new attorneys. I believe they're about to hire like seven or eight attorneys this year. So there's, there are going to be jobs out there. You just, like you said, you have to put yourself out there. And, and San Francisco also has a very good volunteer attorney program that um, gets, tends to hire, they tend to push people out and get jobs almost immediately out there. So we have a student this, semester, this summer who's actually interning full time at Fresno. The Fres oh, the mic. I need the mic. Sorry, I just wanted to let you know we have a student um, who is interning full-time at the uh, Fresno Public Defender Office this summer and getting academic credit for it, so to try to make those connections outside of San Francisco. Okay. I was going to say, to parlay around that, I, I do want us to spend a little bit of time um, uh, talking about what employers look for and how to get experience. Um, and I think externships is one of the great things, but also, and then also ne with networking, how to build connections and how to build them broadly. So maybe we can have that as the next topic is experience building. Um, and I also want to let folks know just broadly what the Bridge Fellowship is since it's been referenced. Um, so the Bridge Fellowship provides modest stipends to graduates who are doing public interest work um, in a volunteer capacity after graduation. And uh, it's being sli slightly retooled to actually make it a bit more flexible moving forward with sort of rolling deadlines um, so it won't be in such strict phases that it's been in so that hopefully it would be more user friendly as we move forward into the next budget year. Um, historically it's been for three months and then potentially renewable for another three months. Um, with the new schema that we're doing we're looking at having it be a flat four month period uh, moving forward. So there's going to be some changes um, but that all those kinks should be worked out in the next month. Um, for folks um, who, who are students now and thinking, planning ahead, there'll be more clarity around that shortly. 
Um, anyway, so if we could maybe start talking about what employers look for and how to get that, whatever that is. <laughs> can, I, can I start? Because I actually have been doing site visits to our externship employers and asking them flat out, what should I tell students to look for? So on my door, you'll see I pull quotes from these employers and I'm putting them up on my door. Um, and the number one thing I'm hearing from, from criminal uh, public, public defenders or DAs, I visited the San Francisco DA's office last semester, I went to a meeting this summer of public defenders, they want self-starters. They want people that they can say, here's your assignment, now go do it, I'm going to court for the day, right? Which makes for a, can make for a very difficult internship experience because you, your first reaction is, I don't know anything, where do I even begin? So I think one of the things that is really critical for you to figure out as a law student is, number one, who else can I ask, right? So here come the paralegals ready to help you. Here come the legal assistants. Here come your fellow law students who might be in their second semester interning or externing. Um, they might be good people to ask first before you ask your supervisor. Find the answer elsewhere if you can. The other thing that I was actually taught at a corporate law firm that I wish I had learned in law school <coughs> is when you receive an assignment from your supervisor, go back to your desk, write down what you think they just assigned to you and email it to them and say, here is what I'm going to be working on. This is my understanding of the assignment. If this is wrong or if this anything requires clarification, please let me know. Um, had I done that, I would have saved myself a lot of billable hours wasted at a law firm because I did a whole assignment thinking I was on the right track and the partner said, this is not at all what I asked you to do, right? So, because I hadn't clarified, it was my mistake. Learn from my mistake, don't let that happen to you. Um, the last thing I would su suggest is when you're talking about tracking your hours, um, employers are looking for people who are gonna be able to not just hit the ground running, but also be very responsible about the assignments that they give them. So if in your prior externship or prior job, you have been very diligent about keeping track of what it is that you've done, when you're interviewing with an employer, you can say, I have specific experience related to drafting a pitches motion, or I have specific experience related to drafting this type of motion. Um, here is a copy of it if you would like to see it. You are building your own portfolio as a law student. So this became really clear to me last week. I was, on, um, I was cleaning out some things, and I found the recommendation letter that the person I interned for in law school, my last year of law school, I worked at the Juvenile Public Defender Office in New York. And my supervisor and I had a pretty good experience, um, but I don't think that we weren't, you know, we, we stayed in touch a little bit after graduation, but for a few months, right? I moved to California, I was clerking, I then decided to do a fellowship application, and I remember asking her to do a, um, would you write a letter of rec for my fellowship application? And she said, sure, you write the letter, and I'll sign it. Has this happened to anybody in here? Right, very stressful experience, right? What am I gonna say? She's wonderful, I love her, she's great. But, but what I had done, and I had been advised to do this by my law school, was I had, had done a journal at, of everything I had worked on for the year, and I kept the journal, and I moved it with me to San, to San Diego. And when she said, let's you know, write the letter, you write the letter, I wrote a very specific, she worked on this particular case, here was her relationship with the rapport with the client, here's what the judge said about, because I had written down, here's what the judge said about the motion I wrote, here's what, you know, and it, it wasn't just for my purposes, it ended up being coming from my supervisor directly, and it was a very powerful. I read it again, and I thought, wow, this was probably the best letter of rec I could have ever gotten, and I wrote it myself. But it's because I had done that tracking. And so that was for a future employer, when you're asking what employers look for. They want specifics on what you can do. They want someone who's a self-starter, and they also want someone who's gonna be agreeable in the office, and who's not, this is what I'm hearing over and over from my extern students right now. Um, what, what, what are the things you want to work on? One of them is, I've heard, I saw three students say this last week, I need to be better at taking criticism from my supervisor because when someone comes to you and you've worked hard and they say this is not good, your response is, what are you talking about, right? I once had a, had a partner in a law firm say, I worked on this brief for two weeks and he came in and said, it's pretty good, you, you have only one space after the periods on page three, and that's a real problem that needs to be fixed. And he left my office and I said, are you kidding me? You gotta be kidding, I've done so much work on this, it's a wonderful brief, and that's his criticism. If you don't know how to take criticism well, you're gonna have a really hard time as a baby lawyer, right, because you have, and, and that's something that supervisors remember, and they will either look at you very well for that for future employment or not. So those are my, that's my two cents. I guess I'll pass it to you. 
Uh, well, I was going to kind of go back to some of Professor Meads's comments about sort of being a self-starter and taking criticism. Um, one of the main things that stood out to me as a learning experience was uh, that these attorneys are not there to teach you. There's very few people in the DA's office whose full-time job is to make sure you're okay as a law clerk. Um, and really, the criticism is the teaching. It's not uh, them trying to pester you or point out commas and periods and punctuation that you spent decades now learning about. But it's really because you know they're saying, okay, this is a good brief, but these are the things that you should work on. This is how I'm going to teach you. And so to that extent, the, the thing I was going to add was that you also need to find a balance between being the eager, hungry uh, volunteer or post bar or whatever, and just not pestering people. There will be times where you're going to have downtime and you need to work on those long-term projects or find things to keep yourself busy there while your supervisor's in trial and you're not there with them or you're just uh, you know, an additional kind of mouth to feed, so to speak, in, in the workplace. Um, it, it's a delicate balance and it really requires you feeling out exactly what the nature and dynamics of your particular office are, but it's something to keep in mind. Yeah, and, and also related to that thing, you gotta be ready for anything. Um, one of the assignments I got, and at the time I remember I got it and I thought this is the worst assignment I could ever have received. It came from the DA himself and he said, I need you to research something, Eric. I need you to look into HIPAA. And then he walked away. <laughs> um, so then I went to one of the chief deputies and was like, well, you know, he said I need to look into HIPAA. Do you know anything about this? He said, yeah. And he explained this whole issue about the problem with the officers and not getting you know, signed HIPAA forms for victims, you know, medical records for cases. And I said, what did you want me to find out? He said, well, look at subpoenas. What do we need? You know, it, It's not a signed HIPAA form because the officers don't want to carry around forms. Okay, so I just dove into this issue that I have no interest in other than my own personal you know, health information privacy uh, in the subpoena ducis tecum for health records. And I looked into it, I read it all, I ended up writing a memo on it, gave it to the district attorney, he came back with critique and, you know, again, it was very vague. Uh, this isn't quite what I'm looking for. Look into it some more. Okay, so I just went and I just read cases and there was not a whole lot of information on it uh, that was available, but uh, so I went to the law itself, everything. Finally, I, I just set it aside because there was no particular due date. And I worked on other, you know, more pressing issues. Um, and, and at one point it just, it struck me. What he's looking for is what sort of subpoena can we do to get these records? And there's two forms that we could get. So I wrote this whole memo on it. And, and by that time, I had a new chief deputy because the old one had retired. And I turned it in, and she, and she took it to, uh, and she returned it to me and said, well, this is great. I have an answer, but you didn't create any subpoenas, sample subpoenas. And so I said, yes, okay, I'll do that right now. Created the sample subpoenas, turned it in again. So it's, it's, it's a process. It keeps going and going and going. Uh, and then she took it, I had no idea, she took it in to the presiding judge in Solano County, uh, Judge Nelson. And he saw it and he said, this is an awesome memo. This is, this is, a, this subpoena is just right. This is, this is what we want to do. I'm okaying this. Uh, and so that was, again, like yours now, something that I put in my cover letters. You know, it's like, look, it's not really... You know, it's not like what you typically think of as prosecution work, but it's something that I did that was important that helped the police so that they didn't have a burden on them and helped our office and the courts to know what to expect in a case where there's victims' medical records. Um, yeah, so always be ready, accept that critique, and just do your best to run with it. Um, again, the secretaries and DA's offices are incredible. Uh, whoever's in charge of the management side of things, like the HR person or whatever, incredible. They know a lot more than you think. And, uh, and if they don't know it, they'll steer you in the right direction. And they, they're not as critical as the attorneys are. They obviously have a different sort of time schedule, although they're always under a crunch themselves. Um, and they generally like the interns. <laughs> you know, they, they'll invite you to lunch more often than the attorneys will. They'll bring in snacks and share them with you, that sort of thing. Uh, so love the staff. Maybe we could get views from the side of the room around experience and, and other things that employers are looking for. How you could use also your schooling curriculum, isn't that? Sure. Um, 
I think one of the things that you really have to be at the public defender's office and maybe even at the DA's office is that you have to be resourceful just because attorneys, it's not that they don't like you, it's that they're not thinking about you. So sometimes they'll say, oh, write me a motion on this issue. Oh, like look it up, it's, it's there. And most of the time it's not there. So you really have to be resourceful and like go to people who might know it or just look it up yourself or if there's a motion that you think you can write and there's not a boilerplate for it, then go and write it, you know, draft it, and then when you think it's complete, then present it to your attorney and see if it works. Because a lot of the time, the motions are um, boilerplates, and so it's, it's easy to, I guess, just rely on these boilerplates. So I would say learn how to write your own motions so that you have a writing sample and so that you can stand out from these hundreds of um, interns that they have at those offices. Um, that's how it is at the public defender's office. And a couple months ago, I went on an interview for a public defender or deputy public defender job. And a lot of the questions that I got was, who is your, who is your favorite client? What was your favorite trial? What was your least favorite client? So I think another thing that they really are looking for, at least at the public defender's office, is just someone who's passionate about the work and then someone who's also compassionate about the clients. Uh, exactly like Angelica said, being resourceful um, and using, if, there, if I had questions and my attorney was on vacation or something like that, I would you know, look for another intern, look for someone in the research department, and if that didn't happen, I come to school and I find someone at school who can help me. A professor, I worked a lot with uh, Professor Rutberg when she was here. She actually helped me find the internship at the public defender's office. Um, but just being resourceful, and if I had a question, um, I could go to LCS as well to help me out. Um, but yeah, being very resourceful, and like I said before, just keeping track of everything. Because in the interviews, they're going to say, yeah, what's your favorite client? And if you have to, if you don't remember, it's not a good thing. They want they want to see your compassion for these clients and they want to see that this is really what you want to do and um, there's uh, d determining if you want to volunteer at like the public defender's office or the DA's office is kind of a big deal um, you can go you can go back and forth um, but they typically what they're looking for is somebody with a passion to be on one side or the other um, and so you need to be passionate about which side you're on you don't well, I just want to say for, and I'm going to, you guys keep that one on your side. I, I just want to say both for documenting experience and articulating it, as well as articulating passion and or talking about, you know, why you might have had prior work experiences or personal experiences that some people would think are in conflict or why you want to work now at either a PD or a DA's office. Like, for example, um, Say you used to work at the sheriff's department and now you want to be a public defender. Um, things like that. For explaining those things, which you need to explain or you will not get a job, um, I really recommend you spending time for any application with law clerk services. Um, and I think now, especially with both One Step in the summer and HLP in the summer, I know folks just went through a big bundling process where um, you know the resumes, cover letters were bundled and sent out in batches, which is quite wonderful in many ways because they can then promote those programs and the superlative nature of the training that you're all getting. What it also means is that your cover letter is going to have to stand out really ahead of everyone else's that's also in that bundling. Um, and I think, you know, any public interest position, and certainly DA and PG positions, and this has already been brought up, you have to show how you're really driven, where your passion come from, comes from, where your connection is to that particular issue, what's driving you to do it, how they know you will be the person who's going to be there 100 hours a week, whatever it is. Um, and if you can't sell that, then that's going to be real liability. So again, I just want to encourage folks to come to LCS and work on your cover letters and materials for particular um, can I add in addition that I think it's important when writing those cover letters or first interviewing to think beyond just your classroom experience. I mean, unquestionably, that is great training. You know, if you take uh, appellate advocacy or any of the more advanced criminal law courses, uh, they'll help you. But it's important to remember that a lot of people in law school who are looking at those positions are also taking those classes. Um, I know that one of the things that helped me personally was when I was applying, I wanted, I knew I wanted to do white <coughs> collar work, even though I only at that point started taking uh, Professor Benedetto Nietzsche's BA class at that time. Um, 
But I had uh, personal experience before law school working as a computer administrator. Uh, I know people in that department had similarly had experience as CPAs or just regular accountants, maybe bookkeepers, things like that. So we were all able to get into that, that department in particular by saying we have analogous skills. I don't know if that holds true, unfortunately, for other departments within a DA's office, but I would imagine they'd like to see that you're you know, a good communicator and you have similar um, personal experience. So just keep both of those in mind. Can we talk about uh, scheduling real quick? Okay, yes. Because one of the things is, it, yeah, because yeah. just, just make sure we get it in. Yeah. Um, if you're interested in doing prosecution, uh, I would strongly suggest, since I, I'm assuming you're all 1L, HLP, or STEP kind of thing, um, that after once you do that, once you finish, you get certified, and you should right now start looking into uh, possible uh, the fall program at Alameda County. If you want to be a DA, that's the number one county in the Bay Area. Um, and if you want to eventually, hopefully, get hired there one day, you have to go through the fall program, and then you have to apply for their summer program. They take limited people, and that's who they hire. A limited number of people from the summer program. Um, Santa Clara also has strict deadlines. Uh, and although they don't usually do the hiring from within, like Alameda County, is a great county to work for. Uh, you get great experience. I have another friend who, who interned there. Um, the highest paid for starting DAs. They are the, the <laughs> highest paid for starting DAs, yes, yeah. in the state. Um, but that's, you know, every, every county's different. And if you don't get into one of those two counties, look at the other counties and try to intern at as many different offices. They all have very different processes, very different personalities, um, and different deadlines. So I would say do that now, rather than like I did, I just kind of fell into it through friends. Well, that's one thing that um, LCS is doing, is that we're trying to bring together a comprehensive list of a broad extended number of counties and when their deadlines are, but also what their practices are in terms of hiring. So which places are places that will really only take folks uh, postgraduate if they've done a summer? Um, if they've done a summer uh, as opposed to an externship, which ones you need to do an externship in order to land the summer to get the post-bar one? Um, so trying to figure out that inside track of how you can maneuver it. And, and also, my other point here would be that you can um, work full time. You could spend because because you're a step and HLP students, your fall, summer, your fall or your spring or whatever semester you're deciding to take as an externship or apprenticeship, we will give you credit. You can get the credit for this. And so go if, if you get a job at the Fresno Public Defender's Office and you think I can't commute to San Diego or to Fresno or wherever or to Nevada, I'm a student in Nevada, like then just go take a, take a semester and do it full time. And you'll get much more experience if you're there Monday through Friday, nine to five, than you would if you're there every Friday for the fall semester. And you'll get the academic credit for it. So come to, come to me, we'll figure out how to make that work. Um, because I do think that that's another way to really prove your, your passion, if you can say it in an interview. I took an entire semester, I moved to Merced, I moved to San Diego, whatever it happens to be, um, in order to work in that office. And uh, like Cynthia said, there is no general database where it says this is when all these applications are due, this is what you need to have. There's nothing like that. And there's a whole bunch of counties in California. So for me, I have like an Excel spreadsheet and I'm just going through them. And some of the websites don't even work anymore. And actually what I learned is a lot of counties don't have public defender offices. They don't have to. They contract out to private attorneys. So doing that research and learning about that um, as you go on will really save you some time and just... Like I said, you know, keeping track of what motions you've written, what writing sample you're going to use, what letter of recommendation you're going to have, stuff like that. Keep track of that and keep in contact with those people so that you can still use them, you know, throughout your application period. Uh, and I, one of the things I um, wanted to mention was obviously uh, we all want to be in a public defender district attorney's office. However, if um, something you have a lot of time and it's, you're not finding a job or whatever you can expose yourself in the court i have a friend who's who actually was able to do this to quite a few people and because of what he was doing in his position because of connections he was making he was able to get a job with a private attorney um, that attorney's taking appointed work so technically he is acting like a public defender but in terms you know you may need to to open up your mind a little bit about what is out there when you're looking for jobs and while you're interning you can make those connections you can introduce yourself to people in court there's dead time in court 
sometimes these private attorneys just sitting there waiting, people are in the back discussing things in chambers, and you can introduce yourself and meet them. And your attorneys in your office will are great resources. They'll say, oh, this guy's kind of a joke, you know, he only comes in here to plead people out. Uh, he never goes to trial. You can learn about uh, people in that county who, who, and because they're private attorneys, they also expose themselves in more of the Bay Area than just the county they're in. So I just highly recommend keeping your mind open that way. I'm glad you brought that up. Contract work um, with private defense attorneys is certainly one of the main ways that many of the Bridge Fellows who do uh, public defense work public defender work with a bridge fellowship or um, a supplement their income is by picking up contract work from private defense attorneys also. It's a bit more challenging for folks who are wedded to doing prosecutorial work because we don't have private prosecutors, right? Um, at least not yet. And uh, so, so that, that is yet another challenge and yet um, it is a really important way, I think, for folks to both be able to continue to build experience while um, they're trying to supplement their income when dealing with the volunteer sort of mechanisms that are in place right now in the industry for public defense work. Yeah, I would also suggest that uh, if it's possible, if you have time to do an internship with a, a non, if you're interested in prosecution, non-prosecutorial type of thing, to find a county counsel's office to get some of that civil experience too. So a lot of prosecution offices now are adding uh, white, co white collar crime units, Welfare, welfare fraud type of units, uh, environmental units, things like that. So if you, if you have some sort of civil experience, you can play that up as well, and that's helpful. And it's, it's some of it's prosecutorial in nature, especially the environmental work. So. And I would add, I would add too. Um, this goes along the lines of diversifying what your resume looks like. So I think most people here know my story, where I started in a public defender office and got assigned a very exciting homicide case, and two weeks in decided this is not for me. And I've been a civil lawyer ever since. And I've never wondered, should I have been a, a criminal lawyer? Because I had that experience, and I knew that. And that supervisor is still a friend. She actually helped me with an article I wrote a couple years ago. So um, there are other opportunities if you don't land in a fall internship or a summer internship. There's a new IRS litigation clinic starting in the fall that's going to be doing prosecutorial work on behalf of the IRS. Um, I have the details up here if you're interested. Marshall Whitley of the tax program asked me to mention it to let people know about this exciting opportunity. We have family law um, litigation opportunities, civil litigation opportunities. You just have to know how to take your narrative and spin it to an employer to make it look like you knew what you were doing all along, right? So I say, I, it, when I was employed, you know, I was applying for civil jobs. Why did you work in a public defender office? Oh, I wanted to understand what some of my clients in the civil homeless legal aid office were going to be going through when they're in the criminal system. And when I got in there, I realized that this is an incredible barrier to them. Um, I spun it, right? Not, oh, I thought I wanted to be a PD and then I changed my mind, right? So you just have to figure out what your narrative will be. You guys are at the beginning of your narratives. Those up here are figuring out what their, look backwards, what did your narrative look like? Um, and so I do think having other opportunities besides just one or two offices the whole way will enable, it looks like you're diversifying your resume perhaps in a strange way, but you really can figure out how to spin that to your advantage. I just wanted to add quickly too, I, I really actually don't know how much of an issue this will be for people ser searching for clerkships or volunteer opportunities with a DA's office. But I remember um, reading, I think it was the volunteer agreement with Santa Clara, you may be prohibited from working outside of that office while you're simultaneously working there. So you just want to check on some of those things beforehand, um, and that may also actually extend back to your, your uh, clerking. Um, I know, for instance, Santa Clara, if you volunteer there, it, it has to be full time. So just wanted to throw that out there. I don't mean to be Debbie down. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so we have about five minutes left, and I did want folks to talk about networking and or geography. We talked a bit about the, the need to be willing to go places. Um, I think that should start, personally, while people are in school. I, I see so many students who are like, I just want to work in San Francisco. And it's like, you know, the Bay Area is really not that hard to access by barge. Um, but just thinking about how, geography but, and in terms of networking and building connections um, if folks could speak to like the power of networking. Uh, after my HLP program, I moved down to San Mateo, and I did that almost exclusively because it opened up a lot of the peninsula for me uh, in terms of job hunting. Now, I'm not advocating that everyone just move south as soon as possible or east, 
Uh, but I'm originally from LA, so San Francisco, while great, is not like the end all be all for me. That would be LA, go Dodgers. Uh, <laughs> but I think that uh, it's important to remember, as Cynthia mentions, that this is a very large community. You know, when you look at jobs in this area, it's the Bay Area as a whole, it's not just San Francisco. Uh, and personally, by moving further south, it really did allow me to, uh, as evidenced by getting a job at Santa Clara, find other opportunities that I think might not have been available. The commute's really not that bad. BART, Caltrain both run down there. So it, it's 70 and sunny right now, so it's nice. <laughs> take, take a look. So a lot of job postings are actually internal. So that means that they don't post it online. They don't post it to the public. So you won't know of these job postings unless you know someone that's working there. So that's really important for networking. Um, in terms of my internship at the Public Defender's Office, I actually got that internship through networking. I was at an event, I met an attorney, and he said, hey, do you want to intern for me? And ever since then, I just never went on an interview for the Public Defender's Office internships, never turned in an application, just went through this attorney through networking. I mean, that was the same thing for me. I met with Professor Rutberg, and she made one phone call to Kathy Asada, and because I had a closer relationship with Professor Rutberg, I had taken her classes before, she kind of knew what I could do, and so she was willing to vouch for me. And so because of that, I actually, I volunteered at the Public Defender's Office throughout my entire law school career, so um, very familiar over there. Uh, but with the whole geographic thing, I have no, I'm from LA too, um, so I have no connections to anywhere. I'm, as much as people don't want to live in Bakersfield or Fresno, I'm fine to go there for a year or two, you know, and then hopefully, just because I volunteered at the San Francisco office for so long, I'm so comfortable there and I like it so much, that is my goal to eventually end up there. Um, but who knows, if I try somewhere else and I like it better, you know, that's where I'll be. I'll just say this, leaving an urban environment sometimes is so critical that at my law school in New York City, when I told them I wanted to apply to jobs only in California, they said, we can't help you. We will only help, this is for clerkships. The clerkship office said, we will only help people who will go by our principles of what we believe you'll have to do to get this job. And one of them is, you'll have to be willing to live anywhere. If you get one in Alabama, you go to Alabama. If you get a job in Chicago, you go to Chicago. I said, I'm a Californian, I'm going back to California, and they said, we wish you luck, right? That's how, I mean, that's how hardcore they were about leaving New York. Because everybody in New York wants to live in San Francisco or New York, that's it. And so they were, they were fed up with law students saying, I won't leave the city, to the extent that they said, if you're willing to leave, we'll help you, and if not, then we won't, right? So clear message to me was, if I want their help, I have to be willing to sacrifice geography. So I, we don't do that here, fortunately. <laughs> we will help you find a job in San Francisco. Um, but it is a very tight market in these urban places, and it is worth considering, you're, especially if you're young and you don't have family responsibilities, it's worth going somewhere else for a few years um, to get the training that you need in order to perhaps come back. So in DA's offices, uh, you had a positive experience in a specialized unit for the most part. DA's tend to get a job and stay there forever. Occasionally they'll transfer into your office from somewhere else. They don't always have connections where they left and they aren't always positive. So interning at multiple placements is really important unless you can get one of those coveted spots in like Alameda or Santa Clara. Um, so I would suggest, right, getting out there, going to, if you could find meetings, right, different, there's different district attorneys groups, right, the Asian Americans and the, the Black and the African American, you know, district attorneys associations, go to those meetings possibly as a student, because um, otherwise it's, it's a small world. They meet each other at conferences and things, but they don't always have the kind of connections that they refer to. That's on the DA side. Uh, yeah, I, I mentioned earlier about being willing to travel, and um, as, as far as connections go, it's which I think we talked about before, one of the things that they're really looking at right now in specific offices, I actually went through an interview recently where the whole interview was basically to see if I would fit in in the office. They asked me no typical PD questions, it was just to see what they felt about me. And when when they start to get further along in that process, they may be asking people in, in the office because they're going to call back to your references and just see how you, um, how you interacted. It's really important to maintain positive relationships with the attorneys and the staff. The staff have a lot of weight in that office. And I've seen multiple law students come in and bump heads with the staff thinking they're more superior or 
whatever, and, and it doesn't work out for them. And, it, and it's really negative on your resume. Someone can find that out. This is a small community on both sides. Everybody knows everybody, and they will talk, and they'll say, hey, when this guy was a law student, he threw a bunch of files on the, on the secretary's desk and said, I need this file in five minutes. I mean, you know, it's just not appropriate behavior. So keep that in mind and um, reach out to as many people as you can. Find out where they're from. They might have connections in other counties because they're laterals from other counties and they're laterals from even other states. I mean, you, just, you, you should just try to get to know as many people as you can, get yourself out there. So I just want to echo the idea of joining different bar associations at Law Career Services. We recommend that folks, when they graduate, that they join three different associations, one that's identity-based, one that's subject matter-based, and one that's geography-based. And sometimes you'll find ones that mesh, like the Women Defenders Association, for example, can be one that um, is full of women who really want to mentor up-and-coming public defenders that are women. Um, but at any rate, I mean, and my advice for that is not just to go to the big events, um, unless you happen to be the 1% of the population that's really good at schmoozing people at cocktail parties. Um, but instead to find like a subcommittee that's doing something, whether it's scheduling a continuing education program or whatever it is, get together with a pack of people and do work, and you will very quickly get to know those people. They become invested in you and start throwing leads your way or talking you up and things. Um, but it's really about relationship building, not just going to things and schmoozing. Um, so I think we're out of time. I just want to say thank you to everyone for participating and sharing your knowledge. Um, I'm really committed moving forward to building up a, a more robust um, information source on different opportunities in different counties. So to the extent that you folks who are going through this now get access to information if you want to share it, um, I'm going to try to figure out the best way to, to spread that information, whether it's putting on LCS online through the employer list and start to collect more and more information about particular employers or, or what have you, um, but so that folks get, so that we start sharing this information and folks don't have to replicate the wheel over and over with all the different counties.